So um, I probably should introduce myself first. I'm Fabia Bromowski, known by many of you, um, and I am the director of the Global Farm Metric. But actually, without further ado, I am going to pass you over to Patrick. Right. Thank you very much, um, Fabia. Uh, to whom I'll mention in a minute, we, we owe a lot. Um, and also thank you so much for uh, joining this uh, call. Um, it's amazing that there are so many people. I had a quick look through the, the list and there are lots of people I know and, and old friends and colleagues from in some cases many years, but also quite a lot of people I don't know, uh, which is really exciting. Um, I think it falls to me to just provide a bit of an overview, but we're going to go into much more detail about where we are and what we're doing uh, in the Global Farm Metric uh, project later in this call. But I think the first thing I wanted to say is, uh, which hardly does need saying, is there is enormous interest in measuring the sustainability impacts of farming systems out there right now. I, I'm here on uh, the farm, our farm, Bochwan and Bauer in West Wales and reading as one does the farming press. Uh, everybody is interested in this now. It's extraordinary. Uh, there was a huge proliferation of interest in measuring sustainability impacts, which is a, a fantastic thing. And it's completely right that there should be that level of interest because after all, uh, if you look at planet Earth, uh, what is the main activity over most of the habitable land surface farming? And as we know, uh, having been part of the problem in terms of climate change and the destruction of biodiversity and social, negative social impacts, uh, there's more and more evidence emerging that farming could be and must be part of the solution if we're going to avoid irreversible climate change and restore nature and improve uh, public health and resilience and all the other things that everyone now agrees that we need to do. Um, but of course, the question is, uh, how can we ensure a harmonious transition from where we are now to where we need to be? And um, how can we make sure that we know that we're making progress along that transition road? Um, I just had a carbon audit on our farm, carbon only, which is interesting in its own right. And if one believes the data, and I'm not sure that I 100% believe it because it's so optimistic, uh, it looks as though our farm is carbon negative. So actually already, contributing to being part of the solution in climate terms, even though there are so many aspects of our farming system here, which uh, have a lot of improvement to be made, most notably energy use, which is currently a bit of a disaster. But it isn't just carbon, as we know that we're measuring, it needs to be measurements of climate impact, but also on nature and natural capital generally, and on people. And so that's the first point I wanted to make that uh, there's a particularly in the, uh, the farming world at the moment, everybody is talking rightly about net zero because we're on a transition pathway and net zero has to be the aim, whether it's 2050 or 2040 or whenever. But if we only measure carbon, uh, we might have unintended consequences. So it's very important uh, that uh, we measure holistically, uh, which is what the SFT with the Global Farm Metric Project uh, is trying to do. And I think just a very brief history, I mentioned uh, Fabia as being an important player in all this. She hosted a meeting, I think it was in 2015 or 16 at the Wadston Estate, which is where she was then working, which brought together a, a bunch of farmers and land owners, all of whom were contemplating um, adopting more sustainable farming systems. And all of whom, including myself, wanted to know what progress we were making. We had a kind of comparison and we looked at our various audits that we were doing. In my case, five audits on this farm. And none of them really told me what I wanted to know, which was whether my impacts on climate, nature and people were gaining ground over last year. So we thought collectively, because there was a huge spectrum of farmers at the meeting, well, given that we're farmers and land managers, we might be in a good position uh, to co-evolve uh, a system of uh, a framework of measurement, which will tell us what we want to know about the various impacts of our farming systems. Fast forward now to 2023, and we've made very substantial progress. One indication of that is we now have 15 people, I think nine of whom are on this call, um, working on the Global Farm Metric 
uh, team. And based on the, the, the maxim that you can't manage what you don't measure, if we're going to accompany, accomplish the farming transition, uh, we need to measure and not just measure, but in a harmonious way. Uh, because the risk, of course, with all this proliferation of interest is that uh, people are using different tools, which is completely understandable. But if they're not connected up at a higher level, uh, then that would be a big problem. So what is our aim? Our aim is not to become active in measuring sustainability and doing audits and all that sort of thing. Our aim is harmonization of the framework of measurement of the impacts of our, uh, our farming systems. And if you think about accounting protocols, everybody in the world runs, who runs businesses will use an accounting protocol, which is profit and loss and balance sheet and all the rest of it. And we need an equivalent language uh, for measuring farm sustainability impacts. And that obviously uh, needs to include, as I mentioned already, climate, nature and people, not just a single impact. And our aim right from the beginning was to create a framework which we hope would then inform all the various users, users of that system. And if you use the accounting analogy, there are auditors, there are accountants, there are business advisors, and there are the businesses themselves, all of whom are united by a common accounting protocol um, infrastructure. And that is what we want to contribute to over time. We have no desire to get involved with uh, directly certifying ourselves, even though that may seem strange since we're doing all these farm trials at the moment, uh, but that's only to make sure that we're, we're going along the right lines. And so therefore we are pre-competitive uh, and we hope that that's an asset in making sure that we don't get involved with the arena that directly involved with the arena that we're trying to um, harmonize. And we've made tremendous progress Obviously, there are a lot of interested parties. There are governments, banks, um, the investment community, uh, the NGO community, uh, farmers and landowners themselves, of course, who are right at the heart of this because our system is measuring uh, sustainability from the ground up, from the farm up, not from the top down, but from the farm up. Uh, but then also, of course, food businesses, retailers, and finally, citizens who want to use their purchasing power to be part of the solution. And all that becomes more possible if we're using a harmonized framework for measuring our sustainability impacts. So our ideal outcome would be possibly to do ourselves out of a job, but hopefully to be a steward and a midwife towards this harmonization. The own, exact ownership of the framework over time may have to be another body which is set up with links, for instance, the European Union to the FAO to the international community but needs to be safeguarded by people who understand land use impacts. I feel I'm going to stop in a minute because uh, I think it's better to hand over to uh, all the people who are going to illustrate the progress we've made but I just wanted to bring up a few issues before I do because it uh, is probably relevant that I should talk about this. So the certifiers, I just wanted to talk about all the people who are already involved with all the schemes that exist whether it's certification like organic or red tractor or leaf or all the other certification schemes, or the very large number of people who are doing carbon audits on farms at the moment. It's, I think it's really important to understand that everybody who's already involved with doing that needs to continue to do their work. And we don't want to get in the way of that in any way at all. So just to give you an example, because I was so involved with the development of organic standards uh, back in the 80s and the 90s, um, organic certifiers, it seems to me in an ideal world, along with other certifiers, would be licensed to undertake farm audits by regulatory bodies. And if we achieved harmonization, then everybody would use the same framework, but there would be many different players offering different services to farmers in the same way that the auditors and the accountants and the business advisors offer those different services, but they would all be using a common framework. That was what success would look like for us. And I think that that's really important because all the people who are working in this field already, some, so many of them have much greater expertise than we do in how to audit and how to carry out those farm inspections. Specifically on organic farming, I think some people in the organic movement have felt worried about our involvement with this because it, it appears we're turning back 
are back on the enormous progress that's been made by organic farmers over the last few decades. And it seems to me that hopefully it is quite the reverse, that um, if the audit is done properly, then I think the performance of organic farmers will be really high. But the crucial thing is that it's an impartial set of measurements and everybody is in, there's not a dividing line, it's more of a stairway to heaven than it is a separation. And we will be impartially measuring our own impacts in the, in the various areas as we go forward, but we'll be united as a farming community, which I think is one of the unintended consequences of the organic movement that we had to set a line, which is the right thing to do back in those days. Above is organic, below is not. And by doing so, we unwittingly polarize the farming community and set up some unnecessary tensions, which I think we can now resolve through this harmonized framework. So I, I think that's probably all I want to say. Are there, yes, one last thing, are there better frameworks out there? Well, this is really interesting. Of course, there probably are. There are other people doing this work and all we want to do is to join with them. So if some of the audits that are going on in carbon, for instance, or the frameworks which are out there, other frameworks, um, are see, feel as if we're competing with them, our answer is we're not. We simply want to join forces with you and come up with the best possible framework, with the best categories and the best measurements of assessing farm and land use sustainability. And by doing so, we can all benefit. So we're inclusive, we're pre-competitive, and we absolutely do, sorry, we absolutely do not want uh, to in any way cast a shadow over all the excellent work that's already going on out there. So I'll give way now uh, to um, Fabia, and then she's gonna take us on. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I will stress that what we really want to get out of part of this call is some chance for you to ask us questions. And I'm going to apologize because I see many of the people on the call who've heard me talk about this. We've had lots of conversations about the global farm metric, but I think for a few who have, you know, who have not had so much engagement, we're just going to run over a little bit of what the global farm metric is uh, the mission of the global farm metric is so bear with me because as i say i recognize the expertise that is going on here patrick has already set out very clearly the challenge that we all face and i think there'll be few people on this call who are not already thinking about it that should we have our first slide rich if that's okay um so we all know about the terrible decline in our biodiversity. We all know how much of our planet is being managed by us as farmers, and therefore what a huge responsibility we take for, um, for what's led us to today. We're also faced as we look for organic, for more sustainable, for more regenerative, that there are still a huge number of people in this world who face hunger. But to all of these problems, we believe, and I think many people on this call believe that, that farming might be part of the problem or might be part of the problem, but is most definitely the only way to the right solution. So I, we, we, we always worry about this language, you know, um, the language of, of the subject that we're talking about is out of date almost as quickly as uh, we're introduced to it. But I think it's worth considering what we mean by a sustainable farm. So just very, very briefly, and there are many, many ways of doing this, and we're talking sustainable, regenerative, agroecological, all of these things in some ways under the umbrella of what we're all trying to achieve. But we're looking for solutions that do provide sufficient nutritious food, fuel and fibre, that really safeguards the ability of future generations, that we are not wasting the extraordinary environmental assets that we have now and our social assets. It's a huge ask and it's something that we've neglected for a long time and that we all play a part in enhancing the local and global systems, not just on the patch that we manage, but beyond that. None of that, I think, will be news to any of you. But what I think is the challenge that we all face is really where to start with this problem. And this was the very question that I was asking in many respects, an, an inexperienced farmer who would sat watching uh, many, many farmers over many years on the various um, uh, management committees I sat, um, is that 
everybody comes at this subject from a different place. There's no common language on farm and farm sustainability. And this leads us all to be confused. The existing definitions so often don't really, really capture that interconnectedness of the system that we have so, so important in what Patrick sets out, this holistic understanding of, of sustainability. We must consider not only the environmental, hugely important as that is, but the social and the economic impacts. You know, if, if we if, if our farming system is not economically viable, we cannot do the work that we need to do to invest in the system to make it better. If we have assessments, you know, as we've begun to get under the bonnet of this problem, it's very easy to follow assessments based on a narrow definition. None of them are bad in their own right. The idea of net zero has been a fantastic organizer for all of us to get behind the real damage we're doing with our carbon and greenhouse gas impacts. Biodiversity credits, a fantastic way to drive um, investment potentially where it's needed. But the danger of that is that parts of the system can go unnoticed and it can result in catastrophic unintended consequences. We're all aware of, of, of ideas of that. And therefore the real importance to constantly come back to ensuring that there is a holistic lens by which we consider the impacts that we're having. No consistent way of measuring means that farmers have to collect data in many different ways. There are switch in different ways. As Patrick says, he's got however many assessments, six or seven assessments. Everybody's asking the question in a slightly different way. It's causing not only confusion, but time wasting and everything else. If we could all look at approaching it at a at the base level, this is not answering every question, but if we could all approach it together at farm level, we could come up with a consistent baseline of data that is then usable for many of the purposes that, that data is asked from farms. It will never be all the data we need, but it will be a fantastic starting point if we come together to create the right framework. So, so that I can move on, because I'd like to introduce Richard Kipling, who is our head of research and has done a huge amount to bring the learnings that we started back in 2015 and has gone right back um, through farmer assessment, farmer testing, farmer trials and science to where we've got to today. Part of our way on the journey. We don't think we'll ever arrive. Just to give a quick overview. So the Global Farm Metric is a framework that will help food and farming stakeholders, starting with the farmer, to understand, measure and monitor the state of the farming system globally. You'll hear that word over and over again in this presentation, but it's where we've really understood it's the most powerful place that this metric can be. It establishes a common language so that we can all understand what we're doing through the same lens as a starting point. Um, and if we get the framework right, and if we inset, if people are able to collect uh, data against the framework, against the indicators within the framework, we will create a baseline of data that will start at farm level and can be used by others uh, in the supply chain. So that's the ambition, that's the mission, is to come together to create this framework together. Um, and I'm now going to hand you over to Richard, who will tell you how we thought. Yes, well. Thanks very much, Fabia. And I should say that the, the research team working on this is myself, but also uh, Lisa Argyle and Lawrence Smith at Reading University, who've been doing a huge amount of work, and also Joe Smith from MVARC Consultancy, who's previously at the Organic Research Centre. So there's been a, a collaborative effort on this, as on, on everything that we try and do, and all of it supported by the trials team and the, the wider uh, global farm metric team. So I want to now sort of go onto the surface a little bit and just clarify what our approach has been to addressing the, uh, the, the issues that we've just been speaking about. And the first step or the, the core of it all is the global farm metric framework. And a lot of you uh, will have seen this before. And we've developed it over the last year to hopefully increase its clarity. And the aim of the framework is to provide this common language and this holistic way of looking at sustainability for all the different players, all the different stakeholders 
um, involved in, in agriculture so that we look at sustainability as a whole. We don't pick one area and have unintended consequences in other areas. And by looking at it in this common way, we can encourage those conversations about how do we improve things? How do we make changes? So having this viewpoint, this perspective, can be a really important way to help farmers understanding at clarity about all those other different schemes, all those different approaches that we've uh, mentioned on the previous slides. And that in itself is um, can be really powerful in helping farmers to be able to see if someone comes to me with a particular scheme, where does it fit into this wheel and maybe challenge and ask them about it as well. But for other people as well to get that overview. So that in policy, in investment, we take this, this wider overview and avoid unintended consequences. So this the framework is a resource in itself. But we realised, of course, that to go with this framework, we needed a way to actually understand what was going on on the farm so that the farmer can then prioritise what needs changing, can identify problems, and also can then monitor the effects of the changes that they make to, to improve the situation. So the indicators that we developed are associated with these different categories of the wheel are what we call state of the system indicators, uh, and I know that's a, a, an approach used in ecology and many other fields as well. So the idea of looking at the state of the system is that we're focusing on what works on each farm. So I'm sure many of us have lots of different ideas about the different practices that can be beneficial or harmful on a farm. Um, but by measuring the state of the system, monitoring how that changes over time, we can look at the effects of those practices. So the farmer can look, the other people in the supply chain can look and say, okay, we've implemented this. Is it working? Is it having any um, impacts that we didn't expect? Are they positive or negative? How can we improve things? So these state of the system indicators are for use in the assessment tools that other people develop. So we're not tool developers, but we're making these available as a way to quantify the state of the system in terms of uh, sustainability across all these different categories. So in order to support that effort by others of developing tools, developing more um, holistic um, approaches to assessments of sustainability, we're using, we have used a global farm metrics research tool in our trials and we're developing a new global farm metric engine. And the idea of that is that we can kind of prove the concepts and show how these state of the system indicators, how monitoring the state of the farming system match the add value for the farmer and for other people in the, the supply chain. And also by trialing these indicators and their application in an assessment, we can contribute and support other people in making more practical assessments and assessments that are easier and more cost effective uh, to be used. So let's have a look in a, a little bit more depth at the framework. I won't go into all the different aspects of it. Um, you can have a look at our slightly more in-depth reports on our website for more information. And obviously we've got the questions and, and answers afterwards. But I'll pick out a couple of things that I think are important to take into account. Um, so if you look at um, 11 o'clock on the world, the, the kind of light green community as an aspect of sustainability, and it, it might be one that doesn't always spring immediately to mind, but the farm is, every farm is dependent on the, the services um, in terms of the farm and in terms uh, of the, the farming family that are available in that community. And having a strong community is, is massively important for the sustainability of the farm whether that's whether there's um, a local pub or a local school or a local abattoir or a farm supplier. It's all really important to understanding how sustainable the farming system is and where we might need to invest to improve that sustainability. But vice versa, the farm also has massive positive impacts on its community in terms of employment, in terms of uh, education events, in terms of access to the countryside, in terms of looking after um, heritage sites and so forth. So this is all, including community is all part of the, this holistic view of looking at sustainability. The second thing I wanted to bring out on here is just to the left of community, you'll see economics in gold and then production in light orange. And I think in a lot of 
frameworks, these get put together as productivity, and indeed they're put together in, in the last version of the, this framework, they were together as productivity. So we've separated them out because when we look at the um, definition of sustainability that Phobia introduced a couple of slides ago, what we need is food security, but to achieve it in a sustainable way and to achieve it while supporting um, the ecosystem, healthy communities, um, and a healthy economic situation. So production, the amount that's produced, the quality of that production, and how it's associated with sustainability in other categories is really important. But economic sustainability is obviously vital for the farm as well. The farm has to survive to be able to produce. And by highlighting the fact that you can have situations of, of high levels of production, high quality of production, but maybe have economic issues, that's starting to focus some attention on how we value what farms are producing. And that's an absolutely key lesson if we're going to improve sustainability in the farming system, is to also look at how we're valuing what is produced by that farming system. And understanding the state of that system in a holistic way is obviously the starting point for that. So that's a quick overview of the framework, and I'll look in a little bit more depth in a second. But I also want to look at the indicators. So we said that the indicators are looking at the state of the system and how that changes over time, and actually being able to measure the state of that system. So the framework's giving you an idea and giving the, the, the producer the idea of what's important. But then for the farmer, and this was the only available symbol online, which is, is not necessarily the, the, uh, the best archetype of a, of a modern farmer, but there we are, we have to deal with what, with what's available. Um, for the farmer, being able to say, okay, I get this holistic overview, I get this idea of where these different elements fit in, how am I doing? So then to be able to use the indicators, to use an assessment based on those indicators, to look, okay, where am I doing not so well, where am I doing well, is the first step in enabling them to prioritise change and to work what needs to change with support from all the resources that are out there to, to do that. And then to monitor and say, is that change working? And what, what does that tell me about how the system works? What does that tell me about what's interacting with what? So for farmers, the indicators and, and measuring them is, is vital. We've mentioned certification and standards. Um, for them, having state of the system indicators and having assessments that are developed based on them is vital because knowing how the state of the system changes in response to farmers, for example, adopting a particular set of standards, so say organic standards or say red traps or whatever it might be, um, being able to know how the system's changing enables you to evaluate how well your standards are performing. Are they doing what you'd expected them to do? If they're not, what can be changed? So evaluation and the role of the indicators and the state of the system indicators in that evaluation is really important. In terms of investors and, and finance, we, we know there's a huge and growing interest in sustainable investment. And again, it's vital that those investors have a holistic view of sustainability um, instead of a narrow view that leads to unintended consequences. But in particular, having indicators of the state of the system helps them to see where the priorities are for investment, where farmers might be struggling more and need support. And it also helps them to then see whether the investment that they've put in has led to the expected changes and then to work with farmers and other stakeholders to explore how that might be improved. For governments, again, a similar story. Um, sustainability policy, sustainability targets um, are absolutely huge at the moment, vital for the, for the country, for a farming sector. But for the government to have effective policy requires them to understand how the system is, how the system is at the moment. So where are the areas that were weakest that need support, but also to see how policies might be affecting the system. So looking at the changes in the system um, after policies have been implemented. For the supply chain as well, understanding the state of farming systems when they're as, as uh, customers of, of farm products, looking at how they might best support the farmers to improve those. But as we also looked at with the economic category and possibly in others as well, 
it also might help the supply chain to understand how they can support farmers themselves as well and what they can change to enable farmers to deliver what the whole of the human race needs them to deliver, which is food security and sustainability at the same time. And that brings us to um, everyone else, the citizens, ourselves, um, as customers, with these indicators, with assessments that are measuring them, we can have more robust labeling, uh, more robust certification, as we've just talked about, and we can start to have more confidence in our farming system. But also with the holistic view, we can also start to ask more questions about whether the direction that particular people put forward is the right one, how we can improve it. So it helps us to be part of that conversation. So we're going to have a look now, just under the surface, to, to kind of bring all that together about what one section of the, the um, framework looks like as we go down into it. So looking at the nature section, you've got three subcategories. So each of the categories in the wheel has three subcategories. For nature, there's farmed up biodiversity, farm habitat, air, soil, and water quality. So basically, this is looking at nature as a whole and then looking at what are the key components that are important that we get right. And again, with it for, for each category, there's a set of aims. Um, for example, in this one, increase biodiversity and protected and protect threatened species and habitats within productive and non-productive agricultural land. To increase the area suitability and connectivity of habitats to species naturally found in the farm's location and to improve ecosystem health and reduce pollution. Now you can see already why the holistic importance of the wheel comes in, why looking at all aspects of sustainability at once is important, because we might be able to start to see where there are trade-offs, where there might be complementarities with meeting these goals for, for nature versus meeting other goals in different parts of the wheel. And managing, recognizing, managing and avoiding trade-offs and searching for complementarities is really important for effective change. So the aims are specific to each category, looking at them together enables us to identify where we might have challenges and work out novel ways to get around them. And then you have the concrete indicators, indicator species for the habitat, for the habitats that are on the farm to understand the quality of that habitat, the abundance and number of species which can be put together as species richness, the area of different habitats, including productive habitats. So um, if you think of a species rich hay meadow, all those different flowers, all those different pollination services, that's actually part of the, the farming system. It's not that we have nature over here and farming in, in a, a different world. Both can have value. Um, air quality, soil toxins and salinity, water quality indicator species. And those indicators start to highlight that not only is the farm involved in sustainability, so so are the people. So pollution on the farm, a poor state of the system there, might not be to do with the farmer. It might be to do with the land use up the road. It might be to do um, with um, other types of impact from off the farm. So this approach enables us not only to focus on farmers making changes, but also to look at who else needs to be involved, who else may be responsible for things that are happening on farms that we need to improve. So I'm going to put all that together in the process of change and then I'll hand that to, to Fabia. So as we started, we have this holistic approach communicated using the common language, which is the, the framework that we started from. So this is people starting to see sustainability in the same way and starting to see it holistically. And that enables us to gain an overview of farming sustainability and of the sustainability of a particular farm. So from the perspective of a farmer, how am I doing? How are things going? Right, okay, I understand what I'm looking at now. I start to see what I might be able to change. But now I understand it's important for me to assess that state of the system. Okay, let's have a look at the assessments that are out there that are using these indicators that are associated with the framework. So assessing the state of the system is the first step to saying, what do I need to prioritise? At this point, they might also want to explore what's causing that state of the system. Why is it in that situation? And what are the impacts of that state of the system more widely? And that helps them and other stakeholders to understand what needs to be done in order to make a change. But with this understanding of the state of the system, 
they can also identify the support that's available for change. And this is where our investors come in. This is where um, government comes in. Being able to understand, as I say, the state of the system, they can say, right, okay, we need to support farmers in these particular aspects in order to make changes. We, we need to give them the information they need to understand what changes to make. And then we can start to implement change. And the key final point is that then we monitor the state of the system and how it responds to the changes we've made. And if it's not responding in the way we expect, why not? What's gone wrong? What are the problems? Are there external influences? This all helps us gain a better understanding, better overview of what's going on in the farm and allows us to start the cycle again. So I hope that gives you kind of a, a broad kind of run through our thinking and why the framework, why the indicators, and also why our trials, our way of um, testing the indicators on the ground uh, can play different roles in driving processes of change towards more sustainable farming. So at this point, I will hand back to Fabia. So, ah, uh, and the, there's always a little animation that I've added that I've forgotten about. So this is highlighting that we're providing the holistic approach, this assessment of the state of the system, the indicators for the assessment of the state of the system, and this common understanding. So Fabia, framework to action. Okay, I am very conscious that we want to hear from you and I'm so bad at multitasking, but I have seen some really interesting questions whizzing across the, the uh, chat. So uh, without too much further ado, just because it's a commonly misunderstood point about the work that we're doing, I thought it was worth pointing out the, the, the mission of the Global Farm Metric being around us all coming together to agree the framework, the common language. We all understand that in order to assess and monitor the state of the system, we do need to have applications of it. We knew, do need to be able to measure and collect that data. Our theory of change is that if we get the framework right and identify the indicators and how you collect data against those indicators, the skill set out there of people, tool developers and assessment platforms will then help to solve for that data collection um, amongst the community so it becomes easier for farmers and easier for other people to use that data to, um, to support their work. An enabler, not a disruptor. But we have to test the theory of what we're doing. So we are, as many of you know, creating both a research tool, but also considering whether creating what we call the engine could help more people collect GFM data through their existing systems or not. So we're looking at all different ways to collect this data effectively. Um, so just to quickly summarize where we are with the process and looking back, um, so I can hand over to you lot to ask us the questions. Um, so we really want feedback. Um, in the chat, there is a link to the report, but it's also on our web website, which sets out in much more detail the, the, the theory, the framework, and the definitions around it, and the indicators. It's all work in progress. Our role is out there, as I said, to promote the framework and the common language. We're developing the assessment tools and we're calling on lots of you to help us in that development. And which we haven't talked about much today, but is an enormously important part of the work we're doing at the moment. We are also beginning to look at the framework in the international context. We've got the great privilege of working with the Regen Pen team, which is a big coalition of, of international players um, and advising and working with them on the framework hub. So lots and lots of work going on but it is still a collaboration and we're still listening to work from you. Now, the other thing that I managed to do was not do the poll. So I'm going to take a slight pause while, while we uh, line up some questions and I can look at some of the chat um, just so that uh, we can do the poll. Here it is. I see it in front of me. I think you can answer more than one question. Gives us an idea of, of the interested parties who are with us today. So I encourage you, please, to, to do it. I think maybe I have to, too. Um, so thank you for doing that. And then I very much want to throw it out to the floor. Now, I have not seen any order of hands, and I am going to ask people, if they can, to ask the any questions that haven't been answered in the chat. I see Ian up there with his hand. Shall we start with you? Because I think we can talk over the, over the yep. poll. 
Thanks, Fabia. Just a quick question. Ian Burrow from NatWest Bank. Um, we are we're struggling to think of ways to incentivize, encourage, cajole, call it what you want, farmers to undertake uh, their carbon auditing, be it a normal carbon carbon capture tool or the whole farm sustainability tool that you just run through. So um, are there any kind of, you know, problem solving $64 million answers to that question? I know it's very difficult, but, um, you know, we've got the capital. We just need people to start start from base camp and really get a, a handle on where they are. And we can't encourage or we can't break through the uh, the farmers incentivizing and help, helping them complete the tool. So any any suggestions or any top tips, please? Uh, well, I would love to put that out to the floor, who are the people that um, want to talk to that. Um, can we see any hands out there? And can I say, if you don't answer the question right now, please put any thoughts in the chat. Please come back to us. We would pass any of that on to Ian, um, who we are working very closely with. Um, am I missing anything? I, I think I can and comment on that as well. And, and thanks very much for the question. Um, and I think from the from the farm trials and um, from the various experiences we've had, there's there's various different things at place. Obviously, we know that collecting all these data can be very time consuming for farmers, um, and that's a that's a challenge. So that's that's one we have to have on the table. If we're doing an assessment, how can we make it as as easy as possible? I think the first thing is about alignment. Um, and this is now not in terms of frameworks or anything, but very simply, when different assessments ask about similar things, can they ask them in the same way? And then can those data be shared? And I know there's a lot of work in, in the world of assessment tools with people um, developing systems to enable the data input for their tool to be put into another tool. So in the GFM engine that we're, we're trialing as a proof of concept, we're, we're testing out ways to, to do that so that farmers can come to a a carbon audit assessment and they can say right here are the data that i collected for previous assessment or for my um farming standards assessment of my accounts i can i can put them at these into here um, obviously with clear knowledge of exactly how they're going to be used so there's that technical solution behind the scenes there's also as we as i'm sure a lot of you will be aware a lot of um work in developing uh, ways to use gis data for example to look at different farm habitats to look at um, water flows and everything in the landscape. So ways that we can collect some of these data for a farm without the farmer having to go out into the field and collect everything. Um, and there are also citizen science approaches. So there's lots of experts in local communities um, that are keen to go out and survey things. And sometimes we might be able to tap into those. So I think it's, I don't think there's ever going to be a silver bullet answer to that question, but I think there's a mixture of methods that are developing. So what we're hoping to do through our trials is to work with other people to see actually what are the best ways to make this easier for farmers. But I think the other side of the coin is to have this common message in this understanding of sustainability, including economic, including production, that helps farmers to see, okay, actually I want to be part of this. This isn't just something that's been forced on me. This is something that can help my system survive more resiliently into the future and can support me in what I'm doing. So that flicking around across a lot of things, but um, I think definitely with our trials, we're looking to collaborate with more people to look at how those solutions can develop. Um, if anyone's got a hand up, please jump in, but I noticed some good questions in the uh, chat. Someone's asking, how do we align with OP2B and Sci platform? We are all partners in our, the big project called Regen 10. What we've all got to understand is there are different frameworks out there that do different things. The GFM is very specifically a framework for collecting data at farm level. Something like OP2B is a framework in which companies are able to report on their impacts at farm level. They need the primary data from the farm to feed into the questions that uh, CEOs, companies, and reports require at the top. They do, they absolutely speak to each other. And SI, as we know, is a wonderful platform out there that's actually on the ground collecting data. What we need is platforms like SI to be looking at the GFM and collecting that data. They will be the vehicle for data collection. So that's I, how we all fit into the jigsaw. Patrick. 
just to add to that, I think it's really important. I touched on it at the beginning, but we want to work with the other platforms like OP2B and Psy, and we are. I was recently at a meeting in northern France with OP2B, with lots of companies that want to do this, but they need actually more data from the ground up. So I think there's a good potential there. And I also wanted to say, just because Ian just jumped in from NatWest, to thank NatWest because, you know, people talk about first mover advantage. I don't think NatWest have had an advantage from backing us yet. <laughs> They've done it because they see the need. And I, I just like to thank Ian and his team and Alison Rose, because I think they can see that harmonization is a necessary end goal. And sometimes you just have to act pre-competitively. And I believe that's what they, they have done. And I hope the other banks come in. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. And I, I think, can I just add to, um, there's another side of the, the assessment, the assessments on the ground that's come out of the trials. And as I say, assessments are, are, are for other people to do, but it, we can share our learning from our, our trials. Um, and I think a, a huge aspect was that the trial, that the um, assessment was quite often a, a learning process for the farmer. And if you have farm advisors involved in that process, they can be giving information to the farmer at the same time and it become, become a rewarding process in itself. So uh, we can focus on making it as simple as possible, but we can also ensure that farmers get something out of the process. And I think quite often, you know, you go in with an assessment, you get the information you want, you leave the farm. And I think it makes a huge difference if farmers have the experience of saying they collected these data, but they also then help me to look at this, these different things. I can see this in a different way. And have that experience. Um, so I think there's there's that side to it too. So am I missing some hands out there, Susie? Is there some anything that I'm missing, or shall we keep with the questions in the chat? Um, there was a question in the chat about data. Absolutely a principle of the, of the global farm metric and any of our discussions about data collection is that the 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 metric is there, the framework is there for farmers to collect data against that data will be farmers until they choose uh, to share that data. Now, obviously, uh, if they enter into a partnership with the supply chain because it's part of their procurement process or a bank because it's part of their uh, financial incentives or their loans or whatever, then there will be arrangements between those two entities about how that data is shared. We have some data um, um, protocols around our trials because obviously we need to use the data in order to to, to um, investigate and report on. So I'm going to ask somebody who's been closer to the chat the questions that I might have missed that we could we could throw out there or anybody like to ask the question that hasn't been answered. Um, I think there are lots of questions about are we working with other people and that is we most definitely are. Um, the, wonderful people from the university that I can't pronounce that begins with W. Um, uh, we've just been doing a, some, a number of calls with them. Oh, Emily, come in. Um, hi, I'm Emily Scott. I'm a um, con consultant at 3 Kill, and we uh, consult on lots of, sort of sustainable agriculture issues. I, I did have a question. Um, obviously, this project is, as Patrick explained, pre-competitive, um, but some of the parties you're engaged with have a commercial imperative um, to promote their assessment um, or their metric. And so I'm interested to understand what you're doing to sort of break down those barriers and how you think it's possible to create something that's truly pre-competitive when there are so many kind of commercial interests for businesses. And Arlo was named in the chat for having their own systems and holding that quite close to their chests. So, uh, we have approached this- that, Fabia. Patrick, you can come in, please. Well, just, uh, because I, I mentioned Arla, or Arla came up in the chat and I responded. I think this is a really important point. All I'd say is I've yet to meet a company, a food business or a retailer that hasn't agreed, at least privately, and I would say mostly publicly, that notwithstanding the fact that many of them are at the moment launching their own schemes like Arla have, for instance, and others have as well in the dairy sector, but in other sectors as well. If you say to them, is it really better that we all measure using a harmonized framework and we may use different providers and you know people who are auditing, but that's, that's like the accountant analogy I gave earlier. They will all say yes. It's very difficult for a company that is competing in a marketplace actually to do this. 
it, because obviously it looks as though they're just trying to, you know, get there first or something like that. So actually it needs a, 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 an organization that has expertise in the field, but is not acting competitively to come in and help the harmonization process. I believe we're in a very strong position to do that. And companies like Unilever, Nestle, Mars, all these big food giants, they would all agree with what I'm saying. And I think that's that's the interesting new development that because of the perilous state of the planet, I think people are thinking in different ways, even those in leadership positions, especially those in leadership positions, actually. And just to add to that, Emily, I think this is this is the point, you know, there are lots of early movers, but what is tending to happen is they are congregating around the net zero pledges that they've made, which makes it very carbon focused. And what we want to do is to make it easier for everyone to continue with that work. That's important work, but to ensure that they're collecting that holistic data as well, which will be equally needed. You listen to any of the uh, task force for nature related disclosures etc you know that it's it won't be good enough we haven't got the data now just to assume that we can use averages and aggregated data they're talking about you know we'll, we'll, we'll um, set those um, targets that everyone will have to move from the top down so we're trying to provide data from the bottom up so we've got some real data to work with yeah, and, and I think, Emily, just at a really practical level, is that the framework and those indicators are publicly available and, you know, always will be. So anyone is free to, to use those. So that enables it to be something that people can use in different ways, um, but enables us to be pre-competitive. Yes, all um, in the comments. Fabia, there's an interesting question in the chat about the ambition with the use of sustainability rather than sort of regeneration. Um, David, <laughs> that was your question. Can I, can, do you, would you like, I can, I can come in on that one. Um, so I think what we've tried to do and what, what we've focused on um, and what I was talking about with the framework is that we've focused on looking at the state of systems and we're focusing, focused on monitoring them. And we want to see the state of those systems improving. Now, there's lots of different language, whether it's regenerative or organic or um, agroecological approaches. And all of us have probably got strong feelings about which of those work, which of those might work, which of those don't work. What we're looking at with the global farm metric is just saying, well, which are the ones that are making things better? Which are the ones that are taking things in the right direction? Which are the ones where we're getting fewer um, trade-offs and more complementarities? And also helping people working in those particular um, sectors to actually see how they can improve. And so I think it's what Patrick was saying before, this, is, this isn't a journey where there's an endpoint and it's like, right, now I'm sustainable because conditions are changing, the environment's changing, everything's changing. So sustainability is an ongoing process and we want to see ongoing improvements in the states of those systems. And we don't wanna have that goal tangled up with particular language, even however much we might agree with that language and think, right, we want to aim for that. This is saying what's working and we can call what's working what we would like to call it. And we can advocate for ways that we think we can make those improvements. But this is about a way to evaluate, okay, put these practices into effect, what's the, what's the impact? Is it doing what we want it to do? So I think that's how we'd, we'd answer that, is it's not um, a lack of ambition, it's not a lack of wanting to see things keep improving, it's wanting to um, actually stay at the level of looking at the change, keeping focused on actually what's changing and is it going in the right direction. Answers your point. Could I just add to that? It seems to me that there is a lot of confusion out there amongst citizens as to what these different uh, labels and schemes mean. And uh, rather than try to set a standard, for instance, for regenerative, been there and done that, if you see what I mean, and it, it, if you create a line above which is bad, good and below which is bad, you're just setting yourself up for a a difficult struggle because people will in equal and opposite ways disagree with the standard one has set but if it's an inclusive scoring type thing based on the performance in the various 
categories and spheres, then eventually that hopefully can find expression on labels. So you will be able to judge somebody's regen against somebody else's regen, depending on how well the performance was with the audit. And that way, we're just putting light on everything and making it all transparent. And also critically making it able for citizens who buy food to compare different uh, schemes and certification programs. So I am very conscious that we have got two minutes left. Um, and quite a lot of the questions in the chat about, you know, which are really helpful for us is, you know, where do you sit alongside X or Y? You will be thrilled to know that for the third time around, we are doing yet another in-depth review of all the international frameworks out there, because what we're trying to do is not reinvent anything, but bring together the best of the best and to make it as simple as possible for us all to navigate this really important subject. So I'm going to ask you all to give us your feedback. Thank you for what you've given today. Thank you for what's in the chat. We've got a feedback form on our website too. We, we have endless and very interesting calls on an ongoing basis. So if, if this has piqued your interest, but you have more questions, please be in contact. We need your feedback. It's the only way that we can develop this in a way that really does work for farmers and for the other people who need to support farmers during this transition. So I think with no further ado and less than a minute to go, I'm gonna just look to Bonnie to make sure I haven't forgotten anything important that I need to say. Um, and if not, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your interest. Please keep watching what we're doing. It is very, very much an ongoing and iterative process. And this year is a very important year to really look at how what we're doing can not only help farmers, but can really fulfill some of the ambition that we have for a common framework. Can I say good? Thank everyone as well, um, Fabian. Also to say, there's a lot of questions on the chat that didn't get fully answered, but we, I mean, we should, we'll answer everything. If anybody wants Absolutely. to me i'm crap at answering emails as probably most of you know but uh, email me and we'll try to get answers and i just think it's important we're completely engaging on this we we don't have all the expertise we need to co-create this we, um, we we know that from experience we've got lots of things wrong and we want to move towards getting it more right absolutely we will circulate the recording and we will answer any um questions that have not been answered in the process of this call of which i'm sure there are many as i so thank you all very much. It's been wonderful to have so many of you on and I hope, I hope you've gone away at least understanding a little bit more about the mission that we are on.